All right, everyone, welcome to Classics 160D2, Classical Mythology, and today's lecture on quest heroines in ancient Greece. And what we're going to find out today is that uh, the reason I call them quest heroines is because it makes for a nice parallel structure. Heroes and heroines, quest heroes, has quest heroines. The quest heroines don't really exist, but we'll figure out about what I'm gonna talk about as we get into this lecture. Let's go ahead and see what we got. All right, uh, we're gonna start, of course, with some announcements and a brief recap. We're gonna define what I mean by a quest heroine, and we'll see that it has almost nothing to actually do with that, but there are a lot of interesting things um, Nonetheless, in terms of how uh, females are heroic in ancient Greece, we're going to take a look at some real heroes. Uh, what we're going to find out is that kind of the way that I'm defining quest heroines are, are more along the lines of the way that actual, for real people were considered heroic in ancient Greece. So we'll, we'll talk through some examples there uh, of regular, real people who become heroes, uh, and then we'll discuss how... Uh, the heroines of Greek tragedy fit that sort of model. And then we're going to look at two examples. We're going to look at Antigone, and here I found out what went wrong two weeks ago, when I thought I had put up a lecture on Helen, and I actually put up a lecture on Antigone instead. Antigone I'm supposed to talk about today, and I am to talk about today. So anyway, if you've already listened to all the Antigone stuff, you'll have a chance to pop off a little bit early and go like do whatever you want. But if you want to hear the story of Antigone and Oedipus once again, I will make it as entertaining as possible and uh, stick around anyway. And then finally, we will talk about Polyxena um, and her sacrifice uh, as a way uh, to consider heroines in ancient Greece. Okay, so what announcements do we have? Well, you guys know the big ones, right? Put your screen in speaker view. You can see me. You can see my ugly mug. You can see all these great words over here. You need them so you can take the notes. Um, and uh, then you're going to be good to go. If you have questions along the way, shoot those off to your TAs. Uh, and they will either get back to you or email me or something. But we will get you an answer. All right, big things on the horizon. You've got a research proposal due this Friday. Um, and then in terms of like assignments after that, just like looking far into the future, you've got one more reading response a week from Friday on the 20th, the Friday before Thanksgiving. That's going to be your final reading response. You are going to be totally done with those after next week. Um, and then the only big assignment left is the actual project. And the idea is after you've done the research proposal, you've got most of your research and what you'll spend the next couple weeks doing is transforming that into something that people actually want to engage with, right? A video or a music video or whatever you're doing for your project, right? Uh, create something cool that conveys all the research you've been putting in but does so in a way that actually is engaging, okay? So three assignments left for the course, research proposal due this Friday, reading response due next Friday, and then the project at the, uh, well, whenever that's due. It's due like the last week of class or the Friday before the last week of class. It's due sometime in December, so I will figure out specific dates down the road. Don't you guys worry. Okay, so. Enough about the sad uh, assignment part of announcements. Um, oh, I have a question in the chat about late assignments. I'm definitely accepting late assignments. Um, as a kind of huge gen ed course, with, especially with a lot of freshmen, you know, especially in these kind of crazy times, uh, it's kind of easy to just get off track, right? And let's say maybe you just didn't do any work for like two months and now you're like, holy crap, that's problematic. I should probably do something now so I can pass the class. Well, you're in luck. We have a very, very generous late work policy. Um, and basically the way it goes is that if you turn it in within a day, you can still get 90%. If you turn it in within a week, you can still get 70%. If you turn it in any time before the end of the semester, you can still get 50%. And you add that up together with the exams and uh, the final project, all the grades that are still out there, you can certainly still uh, achieve your goals in this course. Okay. Now, for exciting announcements, 
We have got a no class on Wednesday this week. Okay, Wednesday is Veterans Day, um, and so no class here. The next class this week is going to be a regular time on Friday. And then in terms of Friday, uh, TAs. So the, the reading for this week, what I'd like you guys to read, you don't have to write a reading response for it, but go ahead and check out the reading itself, um, is uh, Phigenia Among the Taurians. Uh, and so TAs, if you could talk a little bit about uh, the, the stories of Iphigenia. One of the things we're talking about this week is how female heroines kind of, uh, in many ways, um, parallel uh, historical figures um, and historical heroes in Greece. And one of the, the kind of um, interpretations of uh, the story of Iphigenia is that it's very closely linked to the Peloponnesian War. And so if, in addition to um, talking about uh, the story of Iphigenia, you could also talk a little bit about the Peloponnesian War and maybe how like uh, it serves as an allegory for that. Um, that would be really awesome. And then certainly feel free to talk a little bit about the, uh, the final project as well. Okay. Research proposal extra credit. All right, I know everybody is loving their extra credit. Uh, I've been getting some feedback. So the way Think Tank wants you to do this, they do not want you to email them some of the like the form that I'd put up and then e have to email us. They're just like, nah, we ain't gonna do that. Uh, but what I did figure out is that they do su send you like a, a like a summary for confirming your um, appointment, and they send you like a summary afterwards. Okay, so when you get that like summary afterwards, just go ahead and send that to your TA, and that will be all you need to do to get your extra credit. Okay. So don't worry about emailing the, the tutor you work with the, the form. Don't do that. They're just going to be like, nah, we're not doing that. Um, instead, wait for the email they send you and then send that to your TA. And then you're going to be good to go. All right? Cool. Uh, question. Will the lecture of Helen of Troy be added on D2L? Uh, nope, no Helen lecture. That's just going to get confusing about whether it's actually on the exam or not. So Helen will not be a major part of the exam. Um, and I'm not planning to put the, the lecture up there. Okay, so let's go ahead and recap this. Uh, so what we've talked about in the second half of the course so far, right, uh, are heroes and then heroines and then quest heroes and then this week quest heroines. Um, Oh, uh, no, will, will Helen still be a part of the exam? Um, no, I mean, if she's come up in, in some other context, right? She, so, like, uh, the story of Helen and the judgment of Paris might come up in terms of, like, issues about marriage or something like that, something we've already talked about in the course. Uh, but she's not going to come up with anything we haven't talked about yet. Um, okay, so we started talking about heroes, right? And we talked about the five traits of heroes, right? That heroes die that during their life they perform extraordinary, even if they're not exemplary deeds, right? A little bit different than some heroes in the modern world. Um, they tend to die in violent or premature or mysterious ways. And then after their death, they're, wor they're worshiped at their grave site. Uh, and then they're commemorated in ritual and song. And what we looked at uh, the following week, right? The, the kind of remote week um, is uh, that Oh, a uh, question here in the chat. Do they need to meet all five traits or is it okay to only have some of them? So I think for the most part, like most of the traits does the trick. You're going to find a lot of uh, exceptions to the rule when it comes to these sorts of things. So like if it meets four out of five of them or something, it, the person can very much still be considered a hero. Again, these are things that modern scholars have come up with. This isn't necessarily um, some checklist that ancient Greeks themselves uh, made up. So this is a way of, of interpreting these myths from a modern perspective. Uh, so many people that we consider heroes may not fit every single one of those traits, but the majority of them fit most of them. Now, when we look at heroines, we get the exact same list, right? The one kind of major difference, and we're going to see that again today, is that when we look at heroines, they're you know, instead of kind of going out there and using heroic strength or something like that, it's more frequently their ability to endure extraordinary things. Quite frequently, extraordinary pain. And we're going to see that in the stories that we tell today. So the same things, though, right? They die, they uh, perform or endure in extraordinary things. 
Um, their death is often violent or mysterious, something along those lines. And then after their death, they're worshipped at their gravesite and they're commemorated in ritual and in song. Then last week, right, we, we uh, turned to the idea of a quest hero, right? And many of those things still apply, but rather than being known for some particular trait, right, incredible strength or speed or whatever it is, their stories are more closely tied to a particular, the pursuit of a particular person or object, right? Jason and the Golden Fleece. Perseus and Medusa, Bellerophon and the Chimera, right? They're frequently in motion. It's kind of tough to, to really separate them from that main quest that they're on. And then along their way, along the way, along their journey, um, they come into conflict with enemies and monsters, and then they're aided by helpers and friends, right? So again, what we talked about, right, is that many of our regular heroes could also be interpreted as quest heroes. Many quest heroes also have traits that could make them regular heroes. The, the difference is kind of one of degree, not one of absolute um, type. Okay, so regular heroes, regular heroines, quest heroes, quest heroines. Uh, and we'll talk about those quest heroines in just a second. Uh, quest heroes, right? What we talked about last week, we talked about the Perseus and Medusa, right? We're looking at it right here. A nice bronze statue in Florence in the Loggia in the Piazza della Signoria. Uh, Bellerophon in the Chimera, a nice, awesome bronze statue of Etruscan origin. Um, the Chimera of Arezzo uh, in, I don't actually, I'm going to be, I don't actually know. Somebody can find this out for me. Is it still in Arezzo? I don't think it's still in Arezzo. I, like, it was found in Arezzo, but I think it's now in, like, I, I think it's in the National Museum on the Capitol. That's my guess. Can I get a confirmation of that? Anybody confirm, deny? Where is the Chimera of Arezzo today? When you guys go to Italy, when the COVID is no more, it says, the Chimera's in Florence? What? No, come on. Chimera can't be in Florence. Uh, somebody else is asking, um, why didn't Poseidon get punished by Athena like Medusa did? Ah, like, the gods, the big gods, right? The, so, so other people are saying Florence. Where in Florence? What museum in Florence is this thing in? It's the Museo, Museo Archaeological Nacional. All right. I had no idea. All right, there you go. You got to go to Florence to see it. And that's convenient because you can also see our boy Perseus over here. And then... We will see later on in the lecture another statue up here of Polyzena, who we're going to talk about towards the end of the, uh, the lecture. Okay, so Dr. Rob, 0 for 1 on uh, statue attributions today. It happens even to the best of us. Um, oh, and somebody else yeah, was asking, like, why didn't Poseidon get punished um, for uh, taking advantage of Medusa in the Temple of Athena? And the answer is, like, with a lot of these things, the gods never really seem to suffer the punishments, right? It tends to be the people um, and the, the people who don't really have much agency in these situations who end up getting punished. And then finally, right, we talked about uh, Jason and the Argonauts and the quest for the Golden Fleece. And we have these awesome stills of Talos and the Fleece and Poseidon and the Clashing Rocks and Jason fighting the Spartoi, these skeleton warriors. Um, and this is something that you guys will watch over the Thanksgiving break. Um, so go watch it with your families uh, and have some fun making fun of this movie. All right. So what do we mean by quest heroin? So here's the issue. Right? It gets back to not just her quest heroines, but heroines more generally. Women's, uh, women's lives were controlled in large part by men in ancient Greece, right? Husbands had a lot of control over their wives. Um, and, uh, as a re and, and kind of one of the results of that is essentially that um, women's lives were restricted into the private sphere. Um, uh, for the most part in ancient Greece. And so when they did get out of the house, it was to do things like go to the market, go to the temple, go get some water, that sort of thing. Turns out it wasn't to sail across the seas 
or travel to exotic locations or fight in military campaigns, right? The things that make men heroes, right, in ancient Greece are not really the things that, that females end up doing. So how are we to like think about this um, for the ancient world, what kind of weird logic can we <laughs> can we put on on heroines in, in ancient Greece to make them parallel the quest hero? I don't know. It doesn't really work out that well. But but here's the idea. Okay, so rather than like um, going on a quest, right? Their kind of quest is more about understanding the world uh, and benefiting their community, right? So female heroines. Um, are, are in large part considered heroic because of the, the positive good that they're doing. And in this way, they're similar in large part to actual historical heroes who end up like becoming heroes because of the good that they do for society. That's the parallel here, right? Female heroines, unlike males who tend to be exemplary, or extraordinary but not exemplary, females tend to be actually exemplary. They are like really are um, kind of um, uh, portrayed as doing good uh, for the group. All right, and so this is a way to kind of revisit and reinterpret many of the heroines we, we've already looked at here. And what we're gonna see as we go on in this lecture is that these two dudes over here, they're known as the Tyrannicides, we'll see them again, um, and they are a great example of actual for real people in actual for real Greece who became actual for real heroes in their actual for real lives and then actually for real died. And then actually for real were remembered in ritual. <laughs> okay, so uh, when we look at heroes and heroines, right, uh, it's kind of useful to, to think of this um, on a couple different levels, right? So we've got the totally fictional ones, right? And I'm sorry, like, if you want to believe that, like, Perseus, like, was for real, right? And he was just, like, so awesome that eventually these stories cropped up and they were passed along through oral tradition. That's cool. I'm not, I'm not going to take that away from you. But we can kind of think of them as fictional characters, right? These epic characters from, like, the Homeric stories. That's Homeric poems, that sort of thing. Then we've got these semi-fictional characters, right? These kind of mythical founders of colonies or philosophers or poets, those sorts of things. And then we've got like actual for real historical people that we know did exist, right? So we've got like, mm, probably didn't exist unless you really want to believe, in which case I'm not going to stop you. Um, the semi-fictional like may or may not be based in reality, or maybe it's like a kind of a myth is cropped up around a real person, but a lot of the actual facts have disappeared, to actually for real people being remembered for the things that they actually for real did. Now, all of these heroes, all these types, are linked um, by both death, right? All of them die in their stories, and then worship after uh, at their gravesite. So let's talk a little bit about heroes in classical Greece. First gotta hydrate. Today's lecture is brought to you by Kirkland Sparkling Water because regular water is for chumps. All right, let's move on. So as I mentioned, uh, we are gonna talk about <laughs> somebody, somebody says they're a chump because they like water. You're not, I was just messing with you. You're not a chump, regular water is good. Sparkling water tastes like fog? I don't even know how to respond to that. What does fog taste like? <laughs> anyway, enough of sparkling water. It's time has passed. Everybody is really coming at me about the sparkling water now. You guys are out of control. <laughs> okay, the tyrannicides, these are like, think of patricide or homicide, right? Um, homicide, the killing of man. Tyrannicides, the killing of the tyrant killers, right? Um, and these guys lived in Athens, and their names are Harmodius, the young dude, and Aristogeiton, the old dude, all right? So you can always tell, like, the older guy has the beard, young guy does not, and these guys are known as the Tyrannicides or the Tyrant Slayers. Now, to figure out who the Tyrannicides actually are and, like, why they're important, we actually got to start our story a bit earlier 
And this is also kind of like a broadcast. Hopefully you guys will take like a his history course with me down the road one of these days. Um, and when you do, we're going to talk a lot about archaic Greece. And if you remember way, way back to the early days of the course, one of the takeaway points was that like almost everything that we associate with ancient Greece gets its start in archaic Greece, right? Maybe it's perfected in classical Greece, but it gets its start back in archaic Greece. Okay, and so what we're talking about time-wise, starting in the 8th century, going to about the 5th century, first part of the 5th century. Now, in order to understand the story of the tyrant slayers, we have to kind of understand how government worked during the Archaic period. And what we end up seeing is starting way back in the Bronze Age, different city-states, they were independently ruled, but they were independently ruled by, like, really important kings. And if you go all the way back to like linear B language and the very, very earliest forms of Greek, they were known as wanakes. And so there are these powerful kings ruling at sites like Knossos and Mycenae, that sort of thing. Now, as we move from the Bronze Age into the Dark Ages, these great powerful kings are replaced by kind of weaker kings. And this is where we actually get our, our Greek word for king today, Basileus. Um, yeah, in ancient Greek, they were known as Basileis. That's the plural form there. And so guys like uh, Odysseus from the, the Odyssey, right, from the Homeric epics, might be considered one of, he's referred to as like a Basileus, one of these kind of weaker kings. But as we get out of the Dark Ages, right, in large part, the kings of any form tend to disappear. And what that's replaced by is oligarchy. All right? And what that means is the rule of a few. So now it's a group of aristocrats ruling a city-state. And so the trend you're seeing, moving from the Bronze Age to the Dark Age to the Archaic Period, is one of moving from strong centralized political power in the form of one person to more dispersed political power, right? A general move towards equality. And when we think about why that occurs in ancient Greece, there are three main reasons. And again, the kind of reason this is so important to understand, and one of the reasons we focus on it, is because this very, very, very rarely happens. When you look at other places in the world at this time, you look over into the Near East or something like that, the exact opposite thing is happening, right? Rather than giving power out to a group of people, like the empires over in the Near East, they're getting bigger and badder and stronger, and their king is becoming way, way more powerful. So one of the things, one of the reasons this happens in Greece is because the distribution of wealth is far more equal than in places like the Near East. And so one of the, the stories that we get from Herodotus that like exemplifies that, he's talking about how a Greek dude, a super rich Greek dude, could like, um, you know, afford to build a ship and sail it for a year. And that was like, uh, you know, worth 6,000 talents of silver, something like that. Um, and a talent is kind of like a weight measure of silver. So Herodotus is like, that's an incredible amount of wealth. Now, when we look over to the Near East, we're looking at like, like 10 to 50 times that amount of wealth, just in regular aristocrats over in the Near East. So the amount of money that's concentrated at the very, very upper end of the spectrum in the Near East, where there are empires, versus in Greece, where there are oligarchic city-states, um, it's just way, way uh, less spread out. Wealth is less spread out in the Near East than it is in Greece. We also get war, and we talked about this a little bit earlier when we talked about phalanx warfare as representative of democracy. So here what we're looking at is the Kiji vase, uh, one of our very earliest representations of phalanx warfare with these people with their shields covering up their neighbors. Remember the strategy here is you have a huge shield, heavily armored, your shield covers half of you, half of your buddy, you walk forward slowly with your giant spear and you stab people with the pointy end, right? Now the thing is here that this is not really conducive to heroic like individual warfare, it's conducive to teamwork and equality, right? Because if you go off and try to do your own thing, you're gonna get killed almost immediately. 
And we can see what the hoplites look like right here, right? In this, this old bronze statuette from Corinth. You can see the huge shield cover half of you, half of your neighbor. And that's what's represented here in the, uh, the phalanx formation of, from the movie 300. And then finally, in I, when it comes to ideology, um, things in Greece are far more equal than they are in other parts of the world. And one of the reasons for that is essentially that anybody can perform sacrifices. So in other parts of the world, being able to perform a sacrifice for the gods is something that's really restricted just to the priesthood. And while there are like priests in ancient Greece, there certainly is a priesthood, it doesn't prevent other people from like interacting with the gods, praying to the gods, making sacrifices to the gods. Um, no single person can claim like kind of that that soul relationship with a particular God. And so for all these reasons, um, we end up moving towards oligarchy, towards spreading out uh, the rule of city-states among multiple people. And eventually what we're going to see, right, is oligarchy is going to end up turning into democracy, where it's not just the, the aristocrats at the top, uh, but rather um, the, uh, the, the entire citizenry who's making decisions. So again, when we look at oligarchy, a system of government where a small people, a uh, small group of people hold political power. Now here's the thing. <laughs> one of the things we've, we've learned is that, or one of the things you definitely learn if you take the history course is like, whenever you start to try to share power like this, very quickly people are like, well, this is great and all, but wouldn't it be awesome if I just had all the power? And so people come up with all sorts of ridiculous ways to try to get rid of the oligarchy and install themselves as the sole ruler. And that's what we call tyranny, right? Where a single person takes over all power. And so we've got all kinds of stories from this from Greek antiquity. One of the funny ones is there's a city-state um, in, uh, in Sicily that was going to build a temple, all right? And so what they were doing, it kind of works like the modern day when the government wants to build something. And they, they put out bids, right, um, for contracts. And they say, like, who can build this temple for the least amount of money? And people say, hey, I can build that temple for, you know, whatever, 100 talents or 1,500 talents. And the cheapest one, they're going to be like, all right, well, we'll use you to build the temple. So some guy's like, hey, I'll build the temple. It'll only cost me or only cost you this much money. And they choose him. And he takes the money, and instead of building a temple, he hires a bunch of mercenaries, he kicks out the oligarchy, and he installs himself as the tyrant. <laughs> so he just used the state, the city-state's own money to hire mercenaries and take over the city-state. Um, okay, so all sorts of ways that people uh, like to become tyrants. And this happens in Athens because of a number of political struggles. So one of the big problems in Athens is this issue of debt bondage. So basically, like, when you owe somebody money, you have to work for them until you can pay it off. But you're not getting paid while you're working for them. So you never actually end up having the time to make the money to pay them off. So you're just in debt bondage to that person forever. So that causes a whole bunch of problems. We see a number of different revolts. One of the big ones is the coup of Cylon in 632, where the, uh, the oligarchy comes down really hard on this guy who started this revolt. They kill everybody. And it's bad enough where afterwards, the family that did the killing, like everybody's like, you went way too far. And there's like a curse put on these guys. Um, later on, as they're still trying to do that, we get this guy Draco. If you've ever heard of like laws feeling very draconian, um, it means very harsh. And that's because his solution to everything is just kill people. <laughs> so it's like, oh, you stole from your neighbor. You're going to be killed. Oh, you broke like some other little law about littering. How about we kill you? <laughs> um, and it turns out that while that may provide a strong disincentive to commit a crime, crimes still end up happening, and it just ends up, everybody ends up getting killed. So that's also not very good. Now, as a result of these kind of problems, Athens falls under a tyranny, under this guy, Pisistratus, right? 
And over the course of like 50 years, the beginning of the, the, the 500s BC, the first half of the 6th century BC, he's kind of coming into and out of power. And one of the interesting things, right, he keeps getting kicked out, but then he comes back and takes over the city, and then he's kicked out again, but then there's another coup and he takes over. Um, and uh, one of the things is that, like, Athens is doing pretty well under Pisistratus, right? Even though he's considered a tyrant, um, economically, Athens is, like, booming. And, you know, when things are going well economically, people tend to like the way things are, um, and so they don't really dislike this guy. But nonetheless, right, he's a tyrant, he's taken over the city. And that brings us to the tyrannicides, right, the tyrant slayers. And hit, um, let's start by, like, kind of getting our characters in order here, right? So we've got Harmodius, he's the young tyrant slayer. And we've got Aristogeiton, he's the old dude. And then on the other side, we've got Pisistratus, he's the actual tyrant. And then we've got his sons, Hippias and Hipparchus. Right? So Hippias and Hipparchus are the, uh, the sons um, of, the, uh, um, of the tyrant. Now, when we look back at the tyrant slayers, it's easy to think of them as like doing this heroic deed, killing the tyrant and leading the way towards democracy because they had this like ideological objection to uh, tyrants in general. But that's not really the way that it works. So the way it turns out is that Hippias the son of the tyrant, is in love with um, Harmodius over here. But Harmodius, he's already hooking up with Aristogeiton. And so he's like, nah, Hippias, I don't want any of that. And so Hippias, he's all like butthurt about it. And he's like, well, guess what? You know what? I am going to ban your younger brother from the, uh, from the Panathenaic festival. And that's like, we talked about the Panathenaic Festival. It is a big deal in Athens. And so when his younger brother gets banned from that festival, these guys are like, we're not taking that. That like is a diss too far. It ain't happening. So they plan um, to basically kill the sons of Pisistratus, who at, at this time, by this time, had taken over as kind of like dual tyrants from their dad, Pisistratus. So they plan this coup, and they go after and try to kill both of these guys. And it turns out, it kind of does, but kind of doesn't work. They get one of them, right? So they kill one of the guys, but they don't kill the other tyrant. And in the aftermath, they're like basically arrested immediately. Um, Harmodius is killed in the aftermath of this. Um, Aristogeiton ends up getting tortured. Uh, question in the chat about a, uh, a coup. Um, what a coup is, um, is essentially a like political uh, takeover, right? Um, so that, that can be uh, a brief definition of a coup. Okay, so um, it fails, right? They don't get both of the guys. The tyrants aren't totally thrown out. Uh, but in the aftermath, right, like down the road, oh, and both of these guys die in the process. Down the road, though, these guys are remembered as like as some of the most important ter people in terms of getting rid of the tyranny. And then later on, they don't actually establish democracy, but it comes as a result of some of these sorts of things later on. And the way that they are commemorated in terms of um, kind of their ritual commemoration is that they get statues put up in the Athenian Agora. They get songs written about them, uh, praising them for securing equal rights. There are sacrifices offered to them. And then their descendants don't have to pay taxes and get to eat at the public expense. They get to eat for free. So real actual dudes who do real for real actual things. And even though the reasons behind it are kind of weird and messed up, uh, they are remembered as for real actual heroes. Right? And the reason that they are is because they've done something morally good, um, whereas those mythological heroes tend to do things that are extraordinary, but not necessarily morally good. All right, so those are the tyrannicides. Let's go ahead and do attendance for the day. All right, so attendance, uh, it is blue today. Uh, Heracles is looking beefy and blue.
I don't care what you guys say. Sparkling water is delicious, and it's the only type of water. Well, also vitamin water. I drink that. But that's really not water. That's just, like, Gatorade, basically. But whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody's put in the chat, we were going to talk about heroines today, but all we've talked about is men. <laughs> You're totally right. All right, let's get on and talk about heroines. Um, again, if you guys did uh, listen to the Antigone lecture, um, I'm going to be mainly talking about Antigone, so feel free to, I don't know, feel free to listen again. Um, okay, right, so this is reiterating the idea uh, that like, females in large part played a, more of a role in domestic life. Um, rather than in, in public life. Uh, and as a result, um, they're frequently seen in tragedy, which tends to focus more on domestic life than epic, which is more focused on like the big wars and that sort of thing. Right? And we've talked a little bit about that, right? This is just reiterating that again. Epic, the big battles, the big adventures. Tragedy focused more on families, households, interpersonal relationships, that sort of thing. And as a result, when we do talk about heroines, they mainly come from tragedy, right? Drama, plays that would have been put on, rather than epic, things like uh, the Homeric, uh, Iliad, and Odyssey, that sort of thing. That may have been performed, but not necessarily in a theater in the same sort of way. All right, so those tragedies are frequently set in the home. Um, and when we get heroines in these stories, one of the really interesting things is they're not subordinated to men, right? They have their own roles. They have their own actions. Frequently, those actions end up going against the normal way of doing things, okay? Um, and so this is one of the big takeaway points here that female tragic heroines um, like Iphigenia that we'll talk about on Friday, are often used to express difficulties and problems that exist in the for real Greek world, right? So think about this, right? So think about the different demands that you have, right? You've got responsibilities to your family. You've got responsibilities to religion. You've got responsibilities to the state. And very frequently, those things can come into conflict with one another, and so stories like Antigone and like Clytemnestra and Iphigenia end up exploring those difficulties. Now, when we get these female heroines, they often end up acting against males to ensure the preservation of families um, or something along those lines, the proper worship of the gods, the social good. Frequently, they're the ones who actually go against men in order to preserve the greater good. And in doing so, it often has very, very bad results for them. So when we look at like Clytemnestra, right, she does kill Agamemnon um, because he mistreated her in all sorts of ways uh, and she ends up dying in the end. Um, so this is not just trying to like help out, it's, all, it's helping out but doing so uh, while putting oneself at risk. All right, so Big picture, when we look at it, right, this is moving very much away from kind of the gods, right, where you have the gods blessing Achilles with amazing strength and speed and skill in war, to something very human. The kind of motivations behind female heroines and their acts are very, very human in terms of trying to deal with contradictions within Greek society and come up with a useful solution to those. All right. So when we look at these heroines in ancient Greece, we've got a couple already, right? Clytemnestra kills Agamemnon, but avenges Iphigenia. Medea kills her two sons, but makes sure they don't have to live their life in exile. Hecuba, we haven't really talked about her, but she kills the two sons of Polymester, but she avenges the death of her own son, Polydorus. So lots of kind of conflicting, um, yeah, contradictions and uh, conflicts when trying to, to tell the story of these uh, heroines. So the story of Antigone, right, is written by Sophocles in the 5th century BC. Um, and Antigone is the daughter of Oedipus and Jocasta. All right, so I, I apologize. It's back to another story about a guy. <laughs> 
Um, I'm limited by the, the material we've got here, right? You got to take this up with the Greeks and tell them to start writing more stuff about women. Um, Oedipus, right, is born to King Laius and Queen Jocasta of the city of Thebes. But Laius gets a prophecy that his son is going to kill him. And he doesn't want to kill his poor baby boy, right? You don't want to kill your baby. And so he gives him to a shepherd and uh, is telling the shepherd to leave him on a mountain. But this poor shepherd sees him and he's like, this is such an adorable little baby boy. And also, I don't want to be responsible for killing the king's baby. So I'm just going to pass him off to another shepherd. And shepherd number two sees the tiny baby boy. And he's like, this is such an adorable tiny baby boy. I'm going to go give it to the king of uh, the king of Corinth, the king and queen of Corinth. And so there the king and queen raise this baby. So for being orphaned a couple different times along the way, uh, Oedipus ends up still being raised in a royal household, but in Corinth rather than in Thebes. But the king of Corinth gets a prophecy from the Oracle of Delphi. And that prophecy uh, said, or sorry, the um, Oedipus himself gets a prophecy from the Oracle at Delphi. And that he is going to kill his dad and marry his mom. And that's probably about the worst news you can get from the Oracle. That's not even being, like, really tricky. Although, we'll see that a situation makes it a little bit tricky. Yikes, indeed. Okay, so, Oedipus, good dude, right? His first thought is like, how about I just leave? He was, like, he was given... Uh, to the king and queen of Corinth at a very, very young age, he's assuming that they're his parents, right? He's never told that he's adopted. So he assumes that they're his parents, and he's just like, I'm going to get out of Corinth. I'll go live somewhere else for the rest of my life. In no way I'm gonna be, am I going to be killing my dad and marrying my mom. So he goes out there, and he starts wandering around, eventually making his way to Thebes, where he originally came from. And along the way, he gets into a fight with this old dude, right? This old dude, for some reason, they come into a conflict, and he kills this guy, right? And he doesn't think much about it. He's like, well, old dude shouldn't have started something, right? So he kills this guy not knowing that it was King Laius, uh, his actual, for real, biological father. Now, when he gets to Thebes... He's going to do something heroic for the city. So Thebes is being uh, tortured by this monstrous sphinx, right? The body of a lion, the head of a woman, the wings of an e eagle. And in order to get rid of it, he's got to answer this riddle, right? Which creature has one voice and yet becomes four-footed and two-footed and three-footed? And the answer, of course, right, is it is mankind, man who crawls on fours as a baby and then walks his two feet as an adult and then uses a walking stick in old age. And he has solved the riddle of the Sphinx, and as a result, it no longer ends up torturing the city of Thebes. So he's very heroic in that sense. So he goes back into the city of Thebes, and because he has defeated the Sphinx, he marries the widowed queen. Now, it turns out that the widowed queen, of course, is Jocasta, his mother. And so they do some terrible, just god-awful things together, but unknowingly so. But then Thebes has a plague, all right? And the plague in Thebes, um, nobody can figure out how to stop this thing. So Oedipus decides, I've got to figure out who killed the king. If I can take vengeance for that, maybe the plague will stop. And of course... In his, like, pursuit of finding this out, he figures out it was he himself who killed the king. And then even worse, he realizes that the king was his actual dad. And then even worse is that he realizes that the king was his dad, that the queen, who he's now married to, is his actual mom. And then bad things happen, right? So the queen ends up hanging herself, knowing that she's, like, slept with her own son who also killed her original husband. Oedipus takes needles from the dress of Jocasta and stabs his own eyeballs out because of the terrible things he's done. And now we come back to Antigone. All right? So Antigone is the offspring of Oedipus and Jocasta. And she's got two brothers as well, Polynices and Eteocles. 
uh, uh, and they are from the, the same parents. And so afterwards, it's Eteocles and Polynices who are ruling Thebes. And like the story we heard earlier, right, is that while they may start out ruling together, people want sole rule immediately. So Eteocles kicks out Polynices from the city and says, I'm the sole ruler. Then Polynices raises an army and goes back to fight about it. And both of the brothers are killed in the ensuing battle. So at this point in time, King Creon comes and takes over the city. All right. And you may remember him uh, because he was the king involved uh, from Thebes with the story of Medea that you guys read a few weeks ago. And he's like, he tells Antigone, you are not burying or holding any funerary rites for your brothers. Right. This is just going to cause problems. It ain't happening. But Antigone goes ahead and holds these funerary rituals anyway, right? She's like, I don't care that the king, the, the, the ruler of the city-state told me to do something. It's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to respect your family and preserve these rituals and go through with the funerary rites. Now, she has to go to trial for this. And she's like, yeah, I did it. But it was the right thing to do. But Creon is like, too bad you did it. I'm going to bury you alive. At the last minute, though, King Creon's like, actually, that, that's kind of mean. I probably shouldn't do that. You don't have to be buried alive. But Antigone has already hanged herself by this point in time in a kind of weird Romeo and Juliet kind of style misunderstanding of death. Uh, she is now dead, and she is now a heroine. And this sacrifice... Uh, ends up being a marker of a heroine in antiquity. Then everybody starts dying, so the king, or the son of the king, was in love with Antigone, so he kills himself. The queen, the mom of the dead son, kills herself because her son's dead. So in the end, Antigone did what was right, did the noble thing, and everybody started dying anyway. Tons of people died. One of the takeaway points, even if you do what's right, it doesn't always have uh, super positive consequences. Final story, one minute on Paula Zena, right? A similar story of sacrifice. She's the youngest daughter of King Prime of Troy. She's the sister to Troilus, who's prophesied if he can make it to 20 years old, Troy's going to win the Trojan War. He, of course, does not. And in doing so, uh, uh, his sister, Paula Zena, um, is kind of left alone and runs into Achilles. And Achilles is really taken with her, and he reveals to Paula Zena his one vulnerability, his Achilles heel. Now, Paula Zena goes and tells Paris immediately after this, right? And Achilles gets an arrow to the heel for his troubles. Now, uh, the Greeks, of course, do win the war. And in this practice, uh, in, in doing so, Paula Zena is taken. And this is another statue from uh, the loggia in Florence here uh, of the seizure of um, Paula Zena. And it's Achilles' ghost who demands that she be sacrificed at his grave to get vengeance here. And the story of Euripides' Hecuba um, uh, ends up being the story of Paula Zena's sacrifice, where she willingly goes into this sacrifice. She does so um, kind of nobly, willing to give herself for, uh, because it's kind of, it was seen as the right thing to do on behalf of her people. So a similar kind of story, sacrificing oneself for the well-being uh, of others. So that is it for today. Uh, we've got the story of Antigone and Paula Zena as examples of people sacrificing uh, in order to start resolving some of the contradictions between family and religion and state. Uh, one of the ways that we make uh, females heroic uh, in the ancient Greek world. So read the story for Friday. Also, turn in your final draft of your research proposal. Have a wonderful couple days. Uh, I will not see you on Wednesday, but I will see you on Friday. Um, so we will see you guys then. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye.